Greetings and welcome to Kingdom's Teachings. I'm so glad that you've joined us for this week's broadcast. We are presenting today a part two of a message entitled, Take the Stone Away. And last week we talked about spiritual bondage, meaning that we have the um, knowledge that we have the ability and the capacity to experience freedom in and through Jesus Christ but we don't have a full appreciation of the purpose for which God has given us that freedom. We also talked last week about spiritual empowerment and that is choosing life, choosing to walk in and exercise the power that Jesus Christ gave us when he came to the earth, was crucified, resurrected, and now we can live in a life that's empowered by the presence of his Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this word of take away the stone and we pray that as your word goes forth that our listeners will be blessed and that they will truly know that we can be free and experience the total freedom that Jesus Christ died to give us. In Jesus name we pray, amen. So our background scripture was found in Galatians 1.5 which says, in this freedom Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. Stand fast then and do not be hampered or held ensnared and submit again to a yoke of slavery, which you once put off. So last week we started very briefly talking about um, the story of Lazarus um, in John 11 and that's where we wanna kinda of pick back up today. So in John 11, we find Martha, who's the sister of Lazarus, coming to Jesus in a state of grief because her brother who once was sick um, has now died. And before the death, let's back up. She first sent word to Jesus to say that, um, my brother Lazarus, your friend who you love so much and that you're in relationship with the sick. And her expectation was that Jesus would come right then and there because she had faith to believe in the healing power of Jesus. And later we'll see that um, he gives her the faith to believe not only in his healing power, but in his resurrection power. So in John 11, when Martha um, then sends word to Jesus that, okay, first I told you he was sick. Now I'm telling you he has died because you didn't come fast enough or in the time that I thought you would be there. So when Martha speaks these words to Jesus, Jesus gives her a promise up front concerning her brother Lazarus. So let's look at John eleven twenty one 21 through 23. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. So Martha brought a problem, a, a spiritual bondage situation to Jesus. And Jesus takes that problem and he gives her a promise of spiritual empowerment, of knowing that there is a power that comes, can only come from Jesus, that's available in our lives and that was available for Lazarus unto resurrection. In John eleven thirty eight 38 through 41, we find that um, Jesus has left the place that Martha first found him to let him know that um, her brother was sick and had died. And he goes on a journey to where Lazarus' body has been laid. So in John 11, 38 through 41, it says, Now Jesus again sighing repeatedly and deeply, disquieted, approached the tomb. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, But Lord, by this time he is decaying and he throws off an offensive odor, for he has been dead for four days. Notice that Martha shifted her attention from focusing on, okay, Jesus, I think there are some things that you can do for me in this situation, to the natural state of her brother's death. And that's, we do that sometimes, you know, we believe God for great things, but then we kind of look back at things on the natural and we go, okay, God, I believe in you, but we have these situations or these natural circumstances over here. So when she shifted her attention to her brother's natural state of death, what does Jesus do? He says, I already know that, but I am promising you that he's going to rise again, that he will experience a resurrected life. 
So Jesus says to her in verse 40, did I not tell you and promise you that if you would believe and rely on me, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. When he had said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And out walked the man who had been dead, his hands and feet wrapped in burial cloths, linen strips and with a burial napkin bound around his face. Jesus said to them, free him of the burial wrappings and let him go. Jesus commanded those that were at the gravesite with him to roll away a natural physical stone away from the mouth or the opening of the tomb in which Lazarus' body had been laid in. So he tells them to unblock the entrance because I am calling him forth and I need him to be able to get out without any hindrances, without any, um, you know, uh, blockages. The exit has to be cleared. And so today we need to think about, hmm, sometimes we are in a, a tomb-like state. It may be an emotional bondage that we have, um, whether we are um, having depressive thoughts or repressive or suppressive thoughts about something, wherever that place is that we feel like we're kind of in a dark, dead, um, locked away, sealed away place, away from the freedoms that Jesus Christ promised us in his word. And I want to encourage you today, if you're watching today's program, that God's word says, I, even I, God, I call you forth now and to the spiritually empowered and free and liberated resurrected life in and through your faith in Jesus Christ. We do not have to remain in our places of spiritual bondage. We can choose life over death and we can choose liberty and freedom over imprisonment and captivity that spiritual bondage gives us. So I want us to think about some stones that um, we are, um, um, experiencing that may have the um, intentions of blocking our ability to come forth into the things for which God is calling us. And the first stone is the stone of sin. Sin robs us of our hope. First of all, that God is going to deliver us, that God has actually um, blessed and ordained and made available to us the empowerment that comes through our relationship with Jesus Christ. It is that big stone <laughs> that sits at the very um, entrance or the exit where we're trying to come out of a, a different lifestyle, a different way of doing things um, to walk in that light that Jesus Christ has given us. So it is a stone that has to be rolled away and that stone can only be rolled away through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. God offers us forgiveness of our sins. So he calls us forth to confess our sins, to receive his forgiveness and to come forth and be loose and free. Another stone is the stone of playing it safe. You know, sometimes we're like, well, I, at least I know what I have now versus this blind faith, you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen that, you know, God is requiring of me. I think I'll just stick with what I know versus what I don't know. But we cannot play it safe with God because playing it safe means that you're not and I, I am not truly believing and trusting God and the truth of his word. God's word tells us to come boldly before his throne, to make our requests known unto him in faith, and we will have what we ask in his will. So I want to clarify that because it doesn't mean that every single thing that you and I ask for, just because we had a spirit of boldness may come to pass. But in faith, we are praying for God's perfect will to be established and accomplished in our lives. The stone of fear, that should be one of the stones we just need to roll away first of all, because God has not given us the spirit of fear and as believers, we have to know that any fear, any fear is not of God. And so we have to, whether you're a believer in Jesus Christ or whether you're someone who's seeking salvation, even at this very moment, do not let fear rob you of your destiny in Jesus Christ. It's not of God, 
It's of the enemy. And so we need to step out in faith. And I love this little book that I read sometimes um, that's written by one of my um, favorite um, Bible teachers, Joyce Myers. And she has this little booklet entitled, Do It Even If You Have to Do It Afraid. And that book has really just encouraged me that when I have to get out of the boat and walk on some waters and some things that, you know, I may be fear trembling. And even though I know that God hasn't given me the spirit, the spirit of fear, I have to just keep walking and believing him in those things. The stone of rejection. All of us want to be loved and we want to be accepted. And I want to challenge you today that the greater love that you and I can ever desire and experience is to know the love of God, the unconditional everlasting love of God and that he fully accepts us. If he sent his son Jesus Christ to the earth to die for you and I when we were in our sins, why would he now reject us? So we are accepted in Christ and so we need to roll away the stone of rejection, the stone of unforgiveness. If you're watching today's program and you are experiencing unforgiveness towards anyone for whatever reason, I want you to just pray and ask God to heal you and to roll that stone. Take that stone away. You cannot walk empowered and in the relationship with Jesus Christ with the spirit of unforgiveness. The word does not give us any justification for being able to be in a spirit of unforgiveness with anyone at any time for any reason. So we need to roll that stone away. The stone of confusion and you know, this is a stone, again, that's common to man. You know, sometimes when we're spending time in the Word, and I'll just use my own personal testimony, you may not experience this, but when I'm praying and I'm studying the Word of God and I'm hearing, thinking that I'm hearing from God and that He's speaking to me through it, and then I look at all the stuff around and I'm trying to figure out, you know, God, did you say go left or go right? Sometimes it's a little confusing. But then I go back to the fact that I have the mind of Christ and you have the mind of Jesus Christ. And that's where the confusion goes away. But I have to spend that time to say, God, I'm a little confused here. I have the mind of Christ. Can you let that mind come to work in this situation and let me apply it to this area where things seem to be a little gray? And I just ask him for clarity. I ask him to just shine his, you know, his high beam lights on the path and on my thoughts and on my mind so that I can have a, a moment of clarity and not a moment of confusion. The stone of idolatry, you know, this me, 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 I gotta do me first and then I'll get to the things that God wants me to do. You know, after all, this life should be just about me and I only have this one life and one time to go around. The word clearly tells us there will be no other gods other than God himself. So if you've got the stone of um, a false self-importance, I encourage you today through prayer and the word and maybe through accountability with a trusted um, a friend, a prayer partner, a pastor to just seek the help that you need so that you can settle once and for all. There is but one God and that one God is a jealous God and he requires that we praise him and worship him and no other. The stone of shame. You know, the enemy is very good at making us feel guilty about things, our past mistakes, um, our present mistakes, um, that we're not good enough, that we couldn't possibly be accepted, not only by God, but that we can't be accepted by others. The body of Christ is the soul being attacked now by spirits of shame where people are questioning whether that one sin that they did, um, you know, could God really forgive me? Is, is there, do I have to see this again? Will I have to face this again? God says, I will not have you be ashamed. Remember, we represent Jesus Christ. So why would he ashame himself by shaming us? It doesn't make sense. It's a lie of the enemy that he uses to keep us just boxed in. The stone of stagnation you know my life will always be like this i don't expect anything to happen you know if it was good enough for my mother my father you know this is as good as it get it is what it is god word says every new day we awaken to a brand new day of mercies and i don't know about you but that 
it just encourages me and it gives me hope because it means that when I lie down at night and I'm having the rested peace of Jesus Christ, knowing that I don't know what tomorrow will bring, but I know who's bringing me into tomorrow, and that is God himself. So we can't be stagnant. We have to move while God is moving. You know, when Jesus called Lazarus and said, come forth, that was a faith move that Lazarus did. He came out still bound, still in his burial clothes, and like Mary says, certainly he stinks by now. He has a stench and he has an odor. But Lazarus didn't just hide in the tomb and go, no, can somebody send me a change of clothes? Can I get cleaned up first? Then I will come forth. No, he came forth. Today, my sisters and brothers, I want you to just boldly step out in faith. Come forth into the plans and the purposes for which God has made you free, for which he has liberated you and brought you into a place of spiritual empowerment. The stone of hopelessness. Jesus gave his life so that you and I may have hope that we will believe in and trust in the life to which he has called us. And we cannot give hope to not one other single soul if we don't have hope ourselves. We have to be settled and grounded in our expectancy of Jesus Christ if we are to encourage others. I could not come before you and teach you on the word of hope if I did not first believe or know in whom I've believed and place my hope and my expectancy in Jesus Christ. Psalm 27, 13 through 14 says, what would have become of me had I not believed that I would see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living? Wait and hope for and expect the Lord. Be brave and of good courage and let your heart be enduring. Yes, wait for, hope for, and expect the Lord. Wait for, expect for the Lord. That is where our hope must be. That's where our faith must be. If we put our hope in man, sooner or later we will be disappointed. But God never, ever, he is not capable of disappointing us. We may not agree with his terms and conditions. We may not agree with the way that he answered the prayer but he can never disappoint us. To disappoint us would mean that he would disappoint himself, and that is not who God is. So how do I revive hope? If I, okay, Sheila, I, I hear all that, but I'm still feeling a little captive, a little in prison, a little confined. I, I'm not quite on top of my hope game yet. So let's talk about how do we revive our hope. I want you to accept the truth that God loves you and wants only the best for you. You have to believe that if you don't believe anything else, that God created your life for a purpose, to bring glory to him, to be his witness here on earth. And that is our hope, that through faith and relationship with Jesus Christ, not only will we experience the empowerment and the freedom of Jesus Christ here on earth, but we have been given the wonderful promise of living a resurrected life with Jesus, with God forever, for all eternity. That is our hope. When you and I accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, our eternity begins then. We don't have to wait to die to go to heaven. We are eternally in relationship with him. Acknowledge that every good thing is yours. Pray in faith. Believe God, Luke 18, 1 says, men ought to always pray and not to faint. You know, Jesus is not going to fail you in any way, shape, or form. But, you know, sometimes we have to just be patient. Mary wanted and Martha wanted Jesus to drop everything and come right away. But Jesus stayed a few more days before he went to see about not just Lazarus, but Mary and Martha, whom he also loved. Be patient, be patient to experience the full measure of the empowerment that God has for us. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. You know, I've spent a lot of time in my 50 years here on earth waiting on the Lord. And I've, when I look back 
and I see what God was doing and teaching and molding and shaping me in my waiting seasons. I look back and I say, praise be unto God. Thank you, Jesus, that you taught me and you're teaching me how to wait on you. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Lazarus walked out of the tomb. And today, I don't know what tomb you're in, but I know that if you wait on the Lord and you believe and you know in whom you believe and you put your hope in him, my sisters and brothers, you too will walk and you will not faint. Hold on. <laughs> you know, Mary and Martha, they just had to wait until Jesus came on the scene for the resurrected power to occur in Lazarus' life. Psalms 35 says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You know, I'm experiencing a season of my life where this is my morning of joy. And even when I look back at the weeping that endured for many nights, for many seasons, for a lot of different reasons, the joy that I'm experiencing, the joy that I'm sharing and witnessing with you and telling you, it is available for you through the empowerment of the resurrected life that Jesus Christ died to give us. You know, Jesus had to first live in order to die, to be resurrected. He is calling us today to a life in him, to live in the freedom and the spiritual empowerment that he has made available to us. So won't you just live today in Jesus Christ? If you don't know him, now is a good time to come forth and to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he came to this earth that he was crucified, he died. But all oh, the great news is that even though they buried him and even though they rolled a stone to thinking they could hold him in, they couldn't hold him in because it was the power of God that put him in the tomb and it was the power of God that brought him out of the tomb. It was not man's doing. Man was merely instruments that an all-knowing almighty God used to carry out his ultimate plan and purpose for your and my salvation. It was a great cost that Jesus endured for you to walk in freedom and liberty today. And I pray that you will just receive that gift of spiritual liberty that's available through salvation. We have to guard our hearts, you know, on this Christian journey because, you know, once we have been set free, we can't just take that freedom for granted. There's a cost to freedom. And your and my cause is to believe Jesus Christ, to lean on him, to trust in him, to be his witnesses so that others can be set free. You know, you don't wanna just be free by yourself and I don't wanna just be free by myself. I want to see others free. And that's why this is such a privilege and I'm so grateful for the opportunity that God gives me to come to you every week to share his word of truth because I want you to experience the liberties and the freedom and the abundant, prosperous life that I personally know and am living in Jesus Christ. So receive that gift today. I wanna to read to you um, a poem that God gave to me um, a few years ago, and it's entitled, The Strength of Your Faith. Is your faith a vapor that quickly vanishes? a mist that quickly fades, a raindrop that quickly dispels, a tear that quickly dries, a puddle that splashes, a pond that calms, a stream that caresses, a river that flows. Or, is your faith an ocean that creates ripples and waves to help others keep afloat life's waters, surf life's tide, or swim life's laps? What is the strength of your faith? Is someone else's life stronger or better because you chose to believe? My sisters and brothers, what is the strength of your faith? And it's not something that you have to answer in and of your own ability and strength. It is something that is available. It is a knowing that because of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in your life, that we have the strength that can strengthen others to believe. Remember, when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, it wasn't just about 
going to set his friend free, or even in an answer to Mary and Martha's prayer. As you read further down in John 11 and 12, you will see that because of the witnesses, the Jews that were there, and they witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus, they went and told others. So others came to know who Jesus Christ was, the power of his resurrection, the power that's available, that he could raise even the dead and bring them back to life. And that is the purpose for which you and I have been given the privilege and the great responsibility to accept and to receive and to walk out this life of freedom in Jesus Christ so that others will see and know that there's this wonderful great God that we serve that empowers us, that strengthens us, that gives us the ability to live this powerful resurrected life as his witnesses here on earth. Won't you take the opportunity today to join the body of Christ in walking in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? We are celebrating, we are approaching Easter season. What a wonderful opportunity for you to really know the true meaning of Easter and the power of resurrections. It's not just about celebrating that he arose on the third day. If he arose and you don't receive the gift that he arose to give unto us, <laughs> receive the gift. Don't let Jesus' work be in vain in your life. It's not in vain, but if you don't make the personal choice to receive the liberties and the freedoms that Jesus Christ died to give you, it will be in vain for you. I encourage you today to receive the power of the resurrected life that Jesus Christ has given unto us all. In closing, I want to just um, read Psalm 118, 17. It says, I shall not die but live and declare the works and recount the acts of the Lord. I shall not die but I shall live. Today, I invite you to live in the freedom and the liberties for which Jesus Christ died to give you. I invite you to live a life that is empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's broadcast. And I pray that you will continue to join us weekly for the teaching of God's word. And I pray that you will be a witness of this teaching and that you will invite others to join you in studying God's word here at Kingdom's Teachings. Be blessed and we will see you next time. Thank you.